Thank you very much. Uh, I'm super excited to be here today, uh, Blue 22. Um, so today we're going to talk about intercoms. Um, I have a great story to tell you, a great journey that uh, we have started and researched. Uh, but first, let's start, let's start with a bit of uh, formalities. So my name is Sharon Bezinov. I work at Clarity. I'm a vulnerability researcher. Uh, this is my playground. Uh, we have lots of SCADA devices and equipment, PLCs and HMIs, and also IoT equipment, such as cameras and, you guessed it right, intercoms. And I have a question before we'll begin our journey. How many of you here, please raise your hand, have an intercom device at your home? OK. I see many hands. And how many of you have a cloud-based one that you can control from your mobile application? OK. <laughs> so <laughs> I, see, I see some hands here. Uh, we'll, we'll see if you want to keep it uh, in the end of this talk. Uh, we'll see this. OK, so let's start with a bit of a background of why we started this research. So uh, a few months ago, my friend called me. Uh, it was in the middle of the night. And he just told me, uh, look, Sharon, I just bought a new intercom device. It's a cloud-based one. And I installed it in my, in my place. And since then, I um, keep receiving weird phone calls in the middle of the night. Um, and when I answer those phone calls, the mobile application, the associated mobile application of the intercom is opened, and I see some weird offices around the world. And I was like, hold on. <laughs> What, what, what are you saying? Are you saying that you receive weird phone calls from weird numbers, and when you answer those phone calls, you, the associated mobile application is opened, and you see some weird offices? Well, uh, something is wrong here. And he was like, yeah, but it's not for me to interpret. And I was like, OK, so what's the name of the platform? And he told me, too easy, too easy platform. And I said, OK, uh, let me run some checks. And obviously, when you're starting an embedded research, uh, you always start with OSINT. And I started to Google, uh, to Google this platform, Too Easy Platform. And I started to, see, to watch some YouTube videos showing how to configure this device. And I saw how to buy this device, how to configure it, how to install it, how to configure the uh, the mobile application, how to use the panel, how to, uh, how to use the intercom, how to connect all the wires. And also, I looked at eBay. I wanted to think maybe I'll, I should buy it to research it even more. But it, again, it was in the middle of the night. So I, at this point, I did not buy the, the device yet. But I also looked at some documents, um, user manuals, uh, technician manuals. And, and then I found it. Then I found the answer to the mystery that uh, my friend called me for. And the answer was in one of the manuals, I saw uh, some default account. And it turned out to be kind of a technician account that technicians are using in order to test the device. So when, they're buying, when you buy a new device, technicians want to check the connectivity to the cloud. And they want to check if it works. They don't want to use the user account, so they have their own kind of a test account that they are using. And also in the mobile application, also there, there is a feature called test account. And as it turned out, uh, this test account is shared among all the network, all the cloud-based intercom network of this vendor. And apparently, if you download the app and you enter to this test account, you actually log in as the test account, and you start receiving phone calls or intercom calls from people around the world. So how it looks like, so there is an office, let's say this office in somewhere in China, and there is a pre-configured intercom over there that is configured with the test account. So this intercom will call anyone that has the test account configured on their device. And this is exactly what happened to my friend. The technician apparently downloaded the app on my friend's phone and installed and configured the app to be as the test account. So all the intercoms around the world from this vendor started to call the test account because they were not configured at the time. And so my friend got some, those weird phone calls. 
And when he answered, when he picked, when he answered the, the phone calls, he got the, office, the weird office in I don't know, China or Germany or whatever. So what I did, I wanted to test this hypothesis. Again, it was in the middle of the night when I started this research. So what I did was installing a SIP server and configure the SIP server to use the test account. And I ran it for a few weeks. And as you guessed, we received tons of phone calls from different numbers. This, these are special numbers in the intercom network. And everybody called us because we were the test account. And in order to keep ourselves at the test account, we needed to constantly log in and override the, the next test account in the network. So we ran this server for a few weeks and collected lots of numbers. And my friend understood that his mobile application is not configured properly. So mystery solved. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought to ourselves, uh, is, is that it? Um, maybe we can find another interesting, juicy part in this uh, system, which is a bit flawed. Um, and so we went back to the manuals. Uh, now it wasn't in the middle of the night again. It was a, a, new, a new day. And we saw this surveillance door station via 2Easy app. And if you'll read carefully, you'll see that if you have the app, you can enter a surveillance mode and open the camera on the intercom device. And not only that you can open the camera, this is just the first stage, you can also transmit audio as a push to talk feature and also unlock the door. So I was like, oh my god. If, if I'll have an authentication bypass vulnerability, so I could impersonate any user in the network and hack their intercom. I could open the video stream, I could open and unlock the door, and I could transmit audio to speak to their dog, because usually intercoms are outside. And this is when Sparkles came out, and we started the interesting research. And when, again, when you're starting an embedded research or IoT research, the first stage is always OSINT. The second stage is understanding the logistics and what devices are being used and where. So I started to understand what is this device, the intercom itself, the, the unit itself, the outdoor unit and the indoor unit, and the mobile application. So we'll start with logistics. The manufacturer is VTEC. VTEC is a Chinese company. Uh, they manufacture most of the intercoms that you know in Israel. Uh, and we started to uh, collect all the di different puzzle pieces and assemble them. So we have VTEC, this is the OEM, and they manufacture all the intercoms and the panels, HMI, uh, the um, panel, home panels that you can receive the call in. Now, they manufacture this in China and they don't have direct sellers in other places in the world, so they have resellers. Resellers will take the intercom devices or other IoT devices and will rebrand them as if they were local. So in Israel, we have Tador company, and they are, are white labeling the VTEC products and reselling them as if they were their own. And also, they have in Britain one, CDVI, this is the company in Britain, and in all other places around the world. So Almost every time that you see intercom device in, I don't know, great percentage of chances, it belongs to unknown Chinese company and just the logo uh, is rebranded. So that's the logistics. Now we knew what devices we needed to look at. And we started to read the manuals to understand how the system works. So we have two important parts. We have the outdoor intercom. This is where people are ringing the bell. And once they ring the bell, it goes over a two-wire system to a home unit. And the home unit is usually a touch screen. And you receive 
an image from the camera on the outdoor intercom, and you can answer the, the, answer the, the call or the ring. Now, in a cloud-based intercoms, there is a, a second stage. We have the same system. It's a two-wire system. The intercom sits outside. The home panel sits at home. But when you do not answer the, in the, the intercom from the touch screen, it will divert the call through a gateway to your mobile app. And then you'll receive a kind of a phone call. It's a, it's a fake phone call. It's a VoIP call, just like WhatsApp, to your mobile application. And what we want to do, we want to do the opposite. We want to use the surveillance mode in order to get through the VTEC gateway to the home panel. From the home panel, we want to interact with the intercom. And we want to open the camera. And we want to open the door. So that's the plan. All we need is authentication bypass vulnerability. And once we had the plan, we, we knew what we needed to do. And first of all, we needed to understand the, the system as an overview. So let's go over this quickly. We have the intercom. Uh, eventually, what we bought one. We bought the DT607 module. And we also bought the DX471 module. This is the home panel. And obviously, it's a, it's a Wi-Fi monitor. Uh, because m most of the modern uh, panels, intercom panels, are Wi-Fi based. And we decided, obviously, to focus on the Wi-Fi monitor, because this, this piece connects from one side over a two-wire system to the intercom. And from the other side, it transmits to the cloud. So this is our, our, our main target. Now, this target, as I said, is a two-wire system. It has both Ethernet and Wi-Fi capabilities, and also a cloud-based uh, interaction. So there is some kind of user sits in this intercom, which is binded to the mobile application. And somehow, they're communicating with each other because they know how to ring each other in order to initiate a session to transfer both audio and video. So what we did is downloaded the firmware uh, and started to reverse engineer to understand how this binding process work and how user is being entered and uh, maybe generated. Now, the firmware is a Linux-based uh, operating system uh, based on ARM Little Indian. And the main binary, as you can see here, this is uh, the, uh, the firmware when we extracted it. Uh, the main binary is DX471. And you can also see all the other files. These files are the. Uh, some kind of uh, multimedia files. It can be uh, maybe um, the sound of what will happen when someone rings the door. So we can change it to funny stuff, like we did. Or change the logo of the intercom, or change the image. But we obviously decided to focus on the DX471, because that's the main firmware. Now, we also researched the mobile application, the associated mobile application. We downloaded the APK from, uh, from Google. Uh, and we started to reverse engineer the APK. Uh, we, and, and that's both parts from the mobile application to the intercom itself. Now, we, as um, I mentioned earlier, we wanted to focus on the binding. So we really wanted to understand how I buy a new intercom device, downloading the app, and how do I bind my application to the intercom, because if I could control this, I could impersonate someone else, and I could log in to their intercom and get the image that I want so much. Now, I looked again at the manuals, and I saw that in order to bind the application, you don't need to create an account. Uh, that's from the manual. Uh, you can use the mobile app to scan the QR code. And we, we saw a couple of videos from YouTube showing the QR code. So what we did was just scan them. And we scanned one of the QR codes from the installation guide on YouTube and from our mobile application. And we actually got an image, which is censored, because uh, we're good people. <laughs> uh, but it actually worked. Uh, this poor guy in YouTube, he just wanted to share his knowledge 
on how to configure the app. And we abused it to scan the keys QR code and enter to their device. Now, what's behind this QR code? So there are a couple of uh, interesting parts. Uh, the username, the password, plain text, everything, of course. Uh, the domain, the gateway, and the home ID. Now, we have two more parts that are interesting. We have the monitor code and the call code that we'll get into in a bit. But what you need to look right now is the user and the home ID are the two interesting parts. The user is the mobile application user, and it is associated with the home panel, which is the username, which is the home ID. And we have a password being generated somehow. So first of all, we wanted to understand how the username works. Again, we turned out to reverse engineering, and we got to this nice little function. And this little function, what it does is reading from a chip called DS2411 using an IOCTL, and it reads some kind of a serial. Now, if you look at the description of this chip, we'll see. This is the chip, by the way, very blurry. Uh, but we will see that it holds a 48-bit serial number, just like a Mac uh, and Mac address. And so this unique 48-bit serial number resembles the, the username. And it has two parts. It has a constant part, starts always with 04001, 20 bits. And it has 28 bits that, uh, that are being changed across different chips, at least from what we researched. So this is the full image so far. We have two accounts that are being shared by this chip. It's a hardware-based hardware chip, so that's why each intercom has a unique username. And what's being changed between the Wi-Fi monitor, the home panel, and the intercom device is they share the same username, only the first byte Actually, the second nibble, that's the only difference. And you can see up top, the username starts with 0E on the mobile application, and it starts with 04 on the Wi-Fi monitor. So that's how they, share, how they are binded, by the same username. But obviously, we ask ourselves, what about the password? So we looked again, we reverse engineered again uh, the application, and we saw this little nice function. And basically, the password can be easily generated using this one-liner. Uh, it takes the MD5 of the user, it takes the last two bytes, big Indian, that's it. So big fail, yeah, big fail. <laughs> uh, and now we had the entire image in our, in our minds. Uh, we had the, the two-wire system, the intercom, which communicates with two-wire with the home panel. The home panel has the same almost exactly the same username as the mobile application. That's how they know to communicate with each other in the cloud-based network. And the username is based on a hardware chip, DS2411. And the user is generated easily with MD5 big in the end of the last two bytes. Now, we knew how to generate a password. We knew how a username looks like. So what we did, obviously, we created our own pure generator. And once we created our own QR generated, we just needed username, a single username. Because if we had a username, we could generate the password, and then we could scan it with our own application. But how can we get usernames from? So if you remember from the beginning, we started with gaining a lot of phone calls. So they called us, so we will call them. And we just, scan we just generated lots of QR codes from the usernames that called us, and then used the QR in our own mobile app to open the camera stream. And at this point, we could take username, generate QR code, scan it with the mobile application, and get the video feed from the remote intercom. And we ask ourselves, how can we take over all the intercoms, not just one by one, because we're lazy. We wanted to create an automation to do that. So in order to do that, we needed to create our own client first. And to create our own client, we need to understand a couple of things. We need to understand how the SIP network operates, so how all the devices are communicating and establishing communication with each other. 
And we also needed to understand all the different multimedia protocol stacks, like how they're transferring data, uh, like video or, or audio, fr from one to, to the, uh, the other one. And obviously, at the end, we need to implement it ourselves. So let's start with a bit of introduction into SIP networks. Uh, so everybody here are using SIP in one, one way or another. When you're doing a WhatsApp phone call, it uses uh, VoIP communication, and behind the scene, it uses SIP. And when you're using almost any VoIP application, it uses SIP. So at the very basis, SIP is very simple. There is a network server in the middle, and each party in the network, each device, has a unique identifier in the SIP network. And once they want to call the other party, all they need to do is to tell the server, hey, I want to call this number. And the server will say, OK, let's do this. And if, uh, a simple SIP call is very simple. So SIP is a textual-based protocol in UDP 5060. And it can be implemented quite easily because it's, it's textual. A SIP call looks like this. So one party sends an invite request to the SIP server, telling the server, hey, I want to call this number. The server will say, OK, no problem, and will redirect or divert the call to the actual number that we want to call to. And if they really want to answer, they don't have to, but if they really want to answer, they will return 200 OK. We will re receive 200 OK. These are SIP messages and uh, SIP uh, codes. And we will reply with ACK, and then we will coordinate ports for audio and video transmission, and then we'll transmit audio and video. So at the very basis, SIP is very simple. Now, in order to implement this, we first needed to implement the authentication. So the authentication is uh, very simple in SIP. The authentication is based on challenge response. The server sends us a challenge. And we need to do some hash games. You can see at the top, you, we are doing some hash games with this challenge and return to the server the, the overall hash with the challenge. And the server will do the same calculation locally. And if the, the answers, the results are the same, it means we really know the password and we can log in. So we need to, to implement this. Uh, we implement it in Python. And next, we need to understand the multimedia protocols involved. So when we're talking about multimedia protocol stacks, uh, there are different protocols that we can choose from. Specifically in this case, they used SIP for signaling, SDP for metadata and port transferring, and RTP for media transfer, including audio and video. But if you look at the image, you can pick different protocols for the same uh, the same usage, actually. So let's start quickly with the SIP. As I mentioned, this SIP is just for signaling. Hey, I want to call this uh, party. And as you can see here, uh, this is an invite. Everything is textual, so it's a very basic protocol, very similar to HTTP in its structure. And next, over SIP, we're sending SDP. SDP data, which, as you can see down below, coordinates the ports for audio and video, and also coordinates the codecs, how the data will be encoded. So once we have SIP, we can call the other party, and we can coordinate the ports using SDP. Finally, what's left is RTP to encode the data, both the video and the audio. So in this example, the video is encoded using H.264. And again, we needed to understand this very well because we needed to implement it. Uh, I could not find any ready-to-use uh, packages or something like this to implement it, everything, so we actually implemented it ourselves. Now, if you look at a pickup that we captured from a normal device, you can see all the stages that I discussed. So we have SIP to set up a call. We have SDP to coordinate the ports. We have more protocols that are not very important right now. And finally, we have RTP to transfer the audio and video. Now, we had all of this information, so we started to pwn intercoms at scale. And to do that, we needed to build our automation, as I mentioned earlier, that needs to go over all the intercoms and just log in on their behalf and ask the intercom to send a video stream. So how this automation looks like. We have first 
stage of finding usernames. So we needed to brute force 3.5 bytes or 28 bits because we knew uh, the 21st bits, they're constant. And to do that, all we needed to implement is the SIP register request, as I, I uh, showed you earlier with the challenge response. And if the username and the password matches, then we'll get a valid username, and we can move on to the second stage. The second stage is mimicking the actual click on the, on the mobile application that simulates as if someone just wanted to ring their intercom to open the surveillance mode on their intercom. And in this stage, we are sending a SIP invite. And we're waiting for the intercom, since we're uh, part of the network and we're authenticated in the network, we're waiting for the intercom to reply back to us that everything is OK. And again, we're sending first the invite, then we're coordinating the ports and the codecs, and finally, we're starting to receive the RTP stream. But before we can receive the RTP stream, again, up until now, we're just communicating not with the intercom itself, we're communicating with the home panel. At this point, we're getting a blue screen because the two-wire system is not fully configured yet. We're just talking to the home panel. In order to open the camera on the intercom, we need the home panel to tell the intercom somehow, hey, please open the, the camera. And to do that, we're using SIP signaling. If you remember the codes from the beginning, we extracted all the codes from the reverse engineering procedure. And basically, what we're doing is we're telling the home panel, please let the intercom know that we want to open the camera. And we're using SIP signaling to do that. Basically, what it will do, it will signal through SIP to the intercom over the two-wire system some, some keys. So in this case, in order to open the camera, we need to transmit the signaling of one, zero, zero, zero pound. And once we're doing this, the intercom understands that the home panel is commanding it to open the camera, and it starts to transmit data, video data, to the home panel, and the home panel we, will redirect this data to the surveillance mode in our app. So this is the entire automation uh, we built. The final stage is to receive over the coordinated ports the RTP stream, specifically the H.264 uh, encoded stream, video stream, and convert it to MP4 using FFmpeg. <coughs> and the, this is the application, this is the stage in the application that we're mimicking right now. And we have the image. Now, I have a short demo to show you of this entire operation running on a single device. So very hacky stuff. Uh, what you're seeing now is the SIP signaling, the registration, the, the signaling itself, entering the network, transmitting the data from the home panel to the intercom. And once this session is done, we're receiving the, the stream, and we have the video. <laughs> OK, OK. So we, if we have a username, we can open the camera stream, we can transmit audio, and we can unlock the door. And again, we can do all of this using the SIP signaling. The home panel is transferring this data over the two-wire system. And for example, to unlock the door, it can send the, the specific codes that uh, I showed you earlier. Now, all of these are pwned, but we wanted to do this at scale. So one is not enough. The automation runs on one device in our lab. But we wanted to do it on a lot of devices from around the world. So we used our brute forcer to brute force the 28 bits to go over and just search for intercoms around the world. Eventually, we had streams from hundreds of devices distributed across the globe. You can see many devices from Germany and Hungary and Israel and whatever. But we had lots of videos and images. So what can we do with lots of images from all around the world? Obviously, create a collage of blue. And if we'll enhance, we'll see a bit more images and more images. <laughs> Thank you.
yeah, so this is, this is our automation running. You can see everything kind of uh, the Big Brother style. And we let it run. It's, it's just beautiful. We, we let it run for hours, collecting tons of videos, tons of, tons of images to create the beautiful collage I just sent you. Um, and that basically, that's it. That's the interesting part. Now, for the disclosure, we tried to contact the company once and twice and more and more, and they just did not reply to us. They ignored all of our emails, all of our uh, disclosure efforts, and we even called them to China. And a nice lady picked up the phone and told us in an accent that I can barely understand that she insists us to send an email detailing our request. And I told her, I just sent three emails. And she said, no, please send another email. We need your email. And I said, OK, I'm going to send an email, but if, we, if you'll ignore us, uh, we're, we will turn to one of the search organizations. And she said, OK, send an email. And she ignored us, of course. And so we contacted the search IL. They also tried to help us to contact the company because th there is a local distributor in Israel. And they could not uh, get any response from the manufacturer. So we just decided uh, to publish this because I, we think the public need to know about the dangers and the risks in exposing internets to the cloud. So to sum up, a bad authentication design allowed us to hack many devices. And it was due to a mistake, uh, a, very, and it hurt, a very flawed system that allowed us to not only brute force usernames, but also generate their passwords. And we used this to pawn intercoms at scale. So we brought many, many, many video streams in order to create the beautiful collage. And we can use this to unlock doors, open camera streams, and even play sounds. And basically, what we wanted to do here is to say that we need the S in IoT, because many of IoT devices are broken, and we must nudge the vendors in order to them to add security to IoT devices. Uh, that's it. Thank you.